All right, so the session is now being recorded. Um, and just to reiterate, if you do not see your name currently on the attendees list here, there is a link in the chat box of the GoToMeeting um, window that has a link where you'll be able to edit this, uh, this document and you can put your name in there if you don't see it. And I'll also check uh, at the end of the meeting. Okay, so, uh, so this is the monthly SAGE CERT committee meeting. Uh, sorry to schedule it so uh, directly after the um, SAGE user council meeting, which was yesterday, held yesterday at the, um, uh, at the Cook Memorial Library in La Grande. Um, some of you guys, I saw some of you guys there. Um, this shouldn't be too long. I just kind of want to go over a few things and get some people's uh, opinions as well. Kind of the first most exciting uh, order of business is to determine uh, the next meeting time. Um, I just kind of put as a possibility uh, June um, 8th or 15th. Both of those are, I believe, Wednesdays. Um, so, or, whoops, maybe that was wrong. June 8th or 15th, sorry. So that would be the second week of June or the um, third week of June. I was just curious if people had any opinions um, one way or the other. Um, I really don't have any uh, problems with either of these dates. Um, I don't know if anyone else does. Um, I guess if there is no objection, I suppose since we're doing this on the 18th, um, might make sense to at least this time do the 15th just so there's a little bit of a buffer for more uh, kind of items for the agenda. So I would kind of move for June 15th uh, if I don't hear any objections. Um, same time, 10 a.m. Okay, so I do not hear any objections right now, so at least for right now, I'll put June 15th um, as our next meeting time. see in the chat log it looks like there doesn't seem to be any problems with that date so at least for right now let's go with that okay um, so for updates um, I just kind of wanted to give a quick overview of the circ related pieces of the conference that Beth and I went to um, primarily the overdrive API integration and this new feature that you can get in the weeds about but it's pretty cool called um, record badges, which assign kind of tokens to bibliographic records um, that give them more importance uh, in search context results um, when the search is running. So kind of just to real briefly touch on that, I don't want to spend the whole meeting on it, but um, there is a link also right here. If you click on that in the Google Doc, which will bring you to the schedule and presentation page for the 2016 conference. Um, and you can also see, for the most part, there are these links to the presentation. Um, those are primarily up now for all of them that uh, I could see. There are a few that are not. Um, but yeah, if you're curious, there's a lot of information here as well. Um, so for the circulated pieces, 
the main one was this putting the patron OPAC experience into overdrive. I know um, Heidi was also there uh, with Beth and myself, or Beth and I at the, um, at the conference, and we both attended this session. Um, what it basically will do is use the overdrive API so that when we are, for example, um, let me just pull something up here. So when we're on the catalog, um, this will require us to load uh, overdrive mark records into Evergreen, which we um, can do, and there are scripts to kind of facilitate that. So for example, um, we don't really have any test overdrive records, but the process would be, for example, if you wanted to check out um, Lemonade by Beyonce, which Good job, Adam's Library, having that right away. That's pretty cool. Um, you would be able to click the place hold button and authenticate using your library credentials, and you can do it all within the um, OPAC. You won't have to go out to uh, library to go and then bounce back to Evergreen or the catalog. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, we definitely want to try that out. I'm just kind of waiting right now um, to hear from uh, Overdrive so we can actually get the API uh, access key that we need to try it out. I know Heidi's willing to um, help with that as well. Um, so expect more information about that as soon as uh, Overdrive finally gets back to me. I'm actually going to send them another email today to kind of prod them about giving us access to that. Um, so you can kind of see really quick um, the presentation was pretty great. Um, I don't want to go too much into it, but you can kind of see this is what the, uh, the record would look like-ish. This is Sitka on uh, Canada's, but you would be able to have a kind of click to access link here, which is in the 856 field of the mark record. Uh, and once you're out there, um, let's see if they have an idea of it. You can kind of see you have the formats you want. You would click check out and you'd be able to download the either the overdrive copy or the EPUB version. Kind of depends on what is available. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, I'd be excited to get that in. Um, yeah, so have a look at this um, kind of uh, presentation, which is on the schedule and presentation page, which is linked out on the first link here. It's pretty sweet. Um, and then the popularity contest, that was... Um, See if I can find it really quick. So this was from Mike Rylander, who's the, um, I believe he's the CEO uh, of Equinox, um, our support catalog. Um, oh, sorry, Buzzy just mentioned, can you return them via the catalog too? Uh, for the Overdrive copies, you cannot return them. I think for the most part, since Overdrive has the, I think it's, is it seven or 14 day or the two um, checkout periods? It usually you would have to either go into their website or just let it uh, expire. Um, yeah, and Heidi just chatted in as well um, that you have to use the Overdrive website to do the returns. But if the user doesn't do anything on their own, you know, ever, Overdrive will remove that title at that end of that period. Um, okay, uh, and then the popularity contest. Um, this is more kind of for a cataloger meeting, but um, you can kind of see that this is also a big feature with the conference is query relevance, kind of adjusting our search to make it a little easier for patrons to find what they're kind of 
uh, wanting to find, uh, similar to Google and Amazon in a way. So kind of putting in stuff that might not be in the MARC record, um, you know, when was it published, the awards it has. I know a lot of libraries want to see, um, you know, kind of upfront items that are on the bestseller list pushed up higher in the relevance rankings, um, things like that. And so there is work to kind of give bibs popularity rankings based on um, let me get down to it. Kind of scope, who you're looking at, um, and some other kind of a little more involved items uh, here. But the, the main idea is that records pretty soon probably, I would hope, in upcoming Evergreen releases, not 2.10 or 2.11, but probably 2.12 or beyond, um, they will be getting badges that will push them a little higher up. Um, and there's probably going to be little tweaks we can do along the way as well um, while that happens. And yeah, also feel it's a pretty big presentation, <laughs> but um, feel free to look at that as well on the conference schedule and presentations page. Um, and I guess since I see that uh, we've got Heidi here as well. Heidi, did you have anything else to kind of add circa related from the conference that you thought was of note? Okay. All right, well, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, we all had a good time. Um, there are a lot of things that we took out of it, which was kind of mentioned also at the meeting yesterday, but I'll get back to that in a little bit. I just wanted to kind of go over some KPAC updates that have happened. Um, and these aren't really huge, uh, and there is one bug that I want to mention as well for people that um, are using the kids' OPAC. So just to kind of start from square one, if you're on the catalog, the main catalog page, you'll see the kids catalog link here. Um, and you can click on that. And we have a slider uh, with just YA and kids titles. Um, try to make it as general as possible because uh, it's for everybody, uh, not just certain libraries. Um, and so just every month, I try to go through, and you'll see the seasonal holidays button. I try to update that with at least three, uh, three holidays that are happening around the time uh, within the month of the preceding or uh, upcoming month. Um, and these are, you can kind of, if you look at the, let's see. You can look at the URL, it's basically a subject search for Memorial Day. Um, same with Flag Day and Ramadan. Those are kind of the big three that I saw coming up uh, from here to June 18th. Um, and so for while you're in the KPAC, um, so I'll just, uh, this help button now links out to the SageLib uh, .org help page for patrons so they can see that and this will print the screen this little printer icon so if we go to um, an example just a this will just do a search for birds when I click on it um, and it's meant to be a little pretty kind of intuitive and quick for kids um, so for example with the Sibley Birds West if I want to click on more info, <clears throat> you'll see which libraries have it. It just does a quick kind of summary. Um, and you can click get it, which is basically place hold um, for kids. We did do some fixes so that when they want to click on the library to get the information, um, 
that doesn't look so scary. It used to be giant text, uh, but that's now fixed. Um, and so when a patron clicks on get it, or a child, kid, they have two options. They can log in um, with their library card, or it should say also username. I want to put that in there pretty soon. Um, or they can add it to a list, uh, which they have the option to do. Um, and the one thing that I'm not a huge fan of that is a bug that I'll show you in a second is when the kids do log in, it bounces you out to the original catalog. So if I log in, oh, maybe they fixed that. That's good. So I guess <laughs> that's nice. Uh, you can then choose the pickup library or adding it to one of your lists. Um, that's cool. So I guess when they're logging in, um, I'm going to log out real quick. So if they log in after looking at the book, it won't bounce you out, which is pretty sweet. Um, but so that's good. But however, if they try to log in using the button right away, I think this is the issue. Um, yeah, then it will bounce them out to the website, uh, the original catalog where they'll have to log in and then go to kids catalog, which isn't exactly intuitive. Uh, so and so now they're logged in. So I would recommend just kind of leaving it and having them log in using their username, which should work as well, uh, when they're looking at this, uh, when they want to get it. And so that's kind of what's been happening with that. These lists are updated at the same time as, uh, as the normal catalog sliders, which are right, right here. Okay, and that was the bug that I was mentioning with the redirect issue. Um, seems to be languishing at this point, but as long as the patrons are logging in after searching for the item, I think that should help with that. Kathy just mentioned, um, does the click on books selected by librarians mean the new items? Yes, those are, these are items that have recently been added that, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact filters. Um, oh, this looks like a link, but it's not a link. It's just kind of a highlight to point to this, um, this list here, if that's what the question was. And patrons will still be able to see those uh, lists. I'm just going to log out real quick. They'll be able to see those at the new items top lists. And it's the new kids right here. So when they click on that, uh, it will show an updated list with some of those. Okay, hopefully not making anyone sick here. All right, so that was kind of just a brief overview of the KPAC updates. Um, also, when the patron does log in um, and they see the search bar on the right-hand side, it will scope to their library. So if I'm a Baker patron at uh, Haynes and I log in after looking, um, it will uh, scope to that right away, similar to the um, similar to the normal catalog. Okay, and pretty cool next upcoming little update here is the Quick Reports module. Um, I just kind of wanted to give a quick demonstration of that. That was uh, if you, this was a presentation given by Tara McKenna at uh, Pines along with Daryl Rogers, the president of Emerald Data Networks. Um, so the presentation is here. 
Um, they kind of mentioned this code is not part of the core code. So this is actually an add-on. Um, but it is being supported by Pines, which is a very big consortium. Um, so I feel like this, <clears throat> excuse me, this feature will be present in uh, supported going forward. So <clears throat> to kind of jump right in, it's on the test server right now, but we will be putting this on to production as soon as we get some kind of opinions on these reports, which I want to talk about. So if we go to this link, this is what the screen will look like. And right now you can log in using EG test and EG test. Um, yeah, and so this gives you the item, the option to set a quick report, um, view the ones you currently have based on your login, and see the ones that you've kind of started to run but haven't. I don't think this draft report is super useful. Uh, you'll be spending most of your time in the new and my quick reports feature. So for right now, let's just try to start a quick report. There's only one. <clears throat> Under items, kind of size of collection report, you can see when you click the description, it'll give you a uh, kind of description of the report. And then you can just click on create a report and kind of see the, uh, it shouldn't be as scary looking as the interface for uh, reports in Evergreen. So there's that description, um, shows you what's going to be shown uh, under the report name. I'll just call this circ trial test so you can see. Um, you'll kind of do, uh, for the dates, you can choose similar like you had before this or the pop-out. The pop-out is a new um, looking uh, calendar widget. So if I can just do this from, oh gosh, it's the test server, so let's do that to today. Um, you can select all, and before I know you had to kind of shift select, but you have the option now to just select all. You can kind of see that there. Set when you want it to run. Usually leave this as is. Um, you can also, for the most part, leave the runtime as is. And then you can set your email if you want to get that like you did before. Um, and some other options are hidden, but for the most part, you know, if you want Excel or HTML, don't mess with the pivot columns unless you know what you're doing. Um, so you can leave this unexpanded for the most part. And then you'll just click run report. It's a little less <laughs> more developer, but basically it means that it's sent and it's processing now. And the way you can check on your quick report is to simply just go to my quick reports up here or click on the darkened folder here. And you'll see it'll run it in a section. Oh, and it's already finished. So there's that report. Um, and you'll simply click on the link. Um, So EG test, and there it is. There's, I mean, this is test data, so it's not the real stuff. But you can also click on the links to order them, or just download the Excel. And so this will be available always to you unless you run delete report. Um, so, for example, the one that I just did a while ago, I can delete that, kind of queries you, and then it's gone. And that's, for the most part, it. Um, 
I wanted to, uh, Kathy just mentioned when we'll roll it out, that's what I'm getting to. Um, the appeal that I want to look at here is the opinions on the suggested reports. <clears throat> um, a while ago I did a blog post for the ideas for the reports that we're going to feature. Um, kind of three main options, uh, the main groups and types, which like you'll see here, items is one main group. Um, items, holds, circulation, bills, patrons. Uh, those were kind of the main five that were default and I think for the most part generally encompass what general reports people want. Um, and then within those main groups, uh, the types of lists or counts. So you could see right away um, if something was a count or something was a list. So if it was a count of something or you wanted to see all your patrons with um, high balances, for example. So those are the kind of the main groups and types. And then the templates, this is the big, this is the meat and the potatoes. And so these are kind of, you can see the full list here on a Word file to look at the description of the reports and what they entail. Um, and this was just uh, kind of riffing off what uh, Pines is using after they had uh, a group get together to kind of hash this out. Um, so they had ones for bills, the circulations, holds, um, items, and patrons. You can kind of see here, there's that sub list and count. Um, and any existing reports that we currently have uh, in Evergreen are simple to link out um, to this feature. Um, which I would do in the admin menu here. I simply kind of link a template. I just have to look up that ID and then bloop, I can put it in. Um, so I guess the main thing that I like uh, from the attendees here, of which we've got looks like 13, including myself, which is pretty great. Um, it's just please, please. Um, <laughs> either talk with me uh, or Beth after this meeting about this, or just kind of give me your general thoughts, uh, what reports you yourself are running all the time or would like help with running all the time. Uh, this is mainly for ones that we're running constantly, so not kind of edge cases, but the common case. Um, yeah, so if you could look at this page, uh, which I will put in the notes. Um, if you could just kind of look at that and kind of get back to me, uh, that would be great. Uh, if I don't hear a lot or hear um, from a lot of people, I'll probably... Um, I'll probably just go ahead and put in these for the most part, at least right now. Um, I have to build these. We don't have all of these, but um, just have a look at those. That would be great. And just the last thing was just styling options. Initially, I had it set just kind of an easy, quick gray with the default um, evergreen stock dark green. Um, options, but I've since changed it to our uh, catalog gradients and colors to kind of make it uh, similar to what the catalog actually is. Um, and then added a button in to make that look a little clearer. And you can run this from a tablet or a phone. Um, so inventories should be a little quicker to kind of run and check. Um, 
or if you don't want it to be around the cert desk, maybe you have to do a report at home and you don't want to log into the client, uh, this is another option. And we'll likely keep the URL the same. So instead of sage.eou.edu, we'll just have, you know, catalog in front of it, um, simply with report creator. Um, and yeah, so I think that's a pretty exciting feature. I'm real excited to get that going. Um, I think it will help out a lot of staff and hopefully make it a little more accessible for uh, just people that are needing to run these reports on a regular basis. So just have a look at that um, and these featured reports and just kind of let us know. All right. And then uh, I just wanted to quickly, <laughs> I say quickly, but spend too much time on it. Um, a review of the hard due dates. Uh, we have been rolling these out for a lot of libraries. I know uh, there was, I think Anne is here still. Um, we just did hard due dates with Hood River County, or sorry, um, Hood River High School. And uh, despite a little glitch that we fixed with permission uh, groups for the patrons, that seems to be holding uh, pretty well. And to just kind of go over that, what hard due dates do is set a due date for which all items have to be due on, um, regardless of the uh, regardless of the checkout duration. Uh, this is especially useful for schools or uh, institutions that are going to be closed, for example, in the summer and want to uh, want to get their items back in a similar time or no, at the same time. So, for example, I will just look at the hard due dates, show you what I mean. <clears throat> so you can kind of see right now, um, this isn't in use, but uh, Hood River has their senior year end. So if you're a student at Hood River High School, uh, any book you check out, regardless of if it's a three, four, six week checkout period, will be due um, on May 16th. Um, and then for general students, um, that will be due on June 3rd. Uh, and it will not be allowed to go past that. So they will have to have items back by that date. Uh, right. Okay. So there's that. Delia, let's see, Hermes then hi. Alright, we'll make sure to get since I don't see him in right now. <clears throat> Maybe it's not there because it's already huh. um Okay, so that was kind of just a quick overview of the hard due dates. Um, yeah, and then I just wanted the purchase request forms and links are pretty new. Um, you will see that uh, if you're just uh, not logged in as a staff member. So this is what people would see uh, when they went they were looking at the catalog and clicked on, you know, oh, I need help. Um, you'll see suggest item purchase request, which is also suggest a purchase in the drop down. Um, so you'll click that. And we have a links to libraries that have forms or emails available for purchase requests. 
Um, and if there aren't any of those around, we also have a generic purchase request form, which is modeled off of Baker's, um, which basically, you know, kind of gives us what you need, what you want. Um, and after we, Beth and I, get these sent to the sagelib.org address, we'll forward these out to the library. If you're not mentioned here on this list, um, and if you are in attendance here and do not see your library represented and you have uh, a form or an email that you'd like us to direct patrons to, uh, just let us know and we'll put that in. Uh, purchase requests are probably one of the more prevalent uh, requests that Beth and I get from this general form, uh, help form for patrons. So we just want to get that kind of sorted out, make it easier for patrons when we can. Okay, uh, so for the past action items, um, I did go over to Hood River and worked with Buzzy and Harley, um, the youth services uh, staff member there at Hood River to kind of try out acquisition functionality. And Buzzy can uh, chime in if he wants to as well, but I think the, the consensus we had uh, was that as it stands right now for at least Hood River's needs, um, the acquisition interface was uh, a little overkill for uh, the, the needs to kind of what they were hoping to do. Um, I will definitely work with any other interesting li interested libraries to set up the process or to try it out. Um, I know there was some discussion yesterday at the meeting about serials, uh, how to catalog those. I don't know if that might make a difference um, with using the interface. Um, so that happens. It's a renewal survey. Uh, let's see. I don't believe this went out, and that could be on me. Um, and so I need to do that again. Put this at double importance. Get that step up. So people know. I'll talk with you off this meeting as well, Delia, um, to make sure. Okay. Um, uh, I know Heidi was talked about this at the last meeting, but has anyone been encountering any further issues with uh, security items or items with their security tags uh, or stickers? Um, coming into the library? Has that set off any alarms or has that been kind of a continuing issue that people have noticed? Okay, I see. Heidi on chat is saying that uh, Hermiston Public Library is still having issues with it. Um, Okay, so so would this be hmm would this be something for I guess the circuit committee could do this I'm not sure if the if this would be in the government's governance. Um, that's def that's definitely a circulation related yes. issue. Okay. Circulation. 
Okay. Well, I could definitely, um, I mean, if you want to work with me, that we could draft something up and get it up pretty quick. Um, I think it could be fairly general, basically kind of a please do this. Um, but, yeah. We discontinued our uh, security system, so we don't no longer have those cards that go over the security tags in the pockets. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we could get some of those. If, if ours are causing a problem for you, Heidi, I wonder if we could arrange to get some of those um, that you use for your system. Were those so those were security cards you said, Perry? They do they just go over? Um, yeah, they they kind of look like a che an old uh, checkout card where you would stamp and have someone's name. Okay. So I will email you after this, Heidi, to kind of draft something up, as well as seeing uh, besides policy, what is a possible option for that. Um, and if other libraries are experiencing that, please let us know. I'm, I'm not personally at a library, so I haven't experienced this myself. Um, so it's good to hear from the people it affects. Okay. And so Heidi and I are currently working on those holds training documents. Um, sorry to kind of move on here. Um, I've been I've been setting those up, but I got a little kind of uh, sidetracked with the quick reports, um, getting those set up. But uh, we also discussed this yesterday at the user council meeting. Um, kind of for not just a staff perspective, um, but also a patron perspective, how sometimes convoluted it can be to um, just get the item you want. Um, there are definitely some side alleys that we can traverse here with, I think the four types of holds that Evergreen currently allows, it might be five, um, and we currently allow patrons to perform three of them which from a patron perspective, they could use a title hold, a volume hold, or a parts hold. Um, title hold being the main one that they'll see uh, when they go in to this, the place hold button. And if you ever have a question about what kind of hold it is when you're clicking on a link, um, if you just do a quick look you'll see this hold type and kind of uh, T equals title, V equals volume, C equals copy, uh, and so on. That's a way to check if you're just curious what kind of hold you just placed. Um, uh, let's see. Um, it was also mentioned maybe to change the, where was it? So many tabs. Um, change the wording of the holds um, from, you know, title hold to something else. I'm trying to kind of see in the interface where a patron would see that. Um, maybe if people have any ideas for what, you know, is this good enough to kind of say place hold? Do they have an idea that that means it'll look at all the copies? Um, do the patrons know when they click this that it's just for that copy? Um, is the wording okay here? Um, Heidi mentioned the volume holds used to say hold this copy or something similar. 
Um, and just kind of as a, a check on another evergreen system, what they look like. Um, let's see. So this is Pines over in Georgia. Oh, there you go. Cats, cats, cats. Um, so they look like they stick with the default place hold. Um, and there is no option for volume holds. Um, it isn't an, uh, that was a kind of customization for Sage uh, that we had put in. Um, okay, so I guess I was just wondering if anyone had any thoughts about the wording for holds. Um, have you been hearing from patrons that it's, uh, you know, a little too difficult. I know the advanced hold options here, uh, that's seldom used. Uh, I wouldn't really, I don't know, the formats for the most part they're going to want as what is in the record. Um, I guess, yeah. Order any copies. So Perry mentions, um, let's see here. Something about uh, title being order any copy and volume being order this copy. Heidi's saying order first available copy um, as well, I think, for a title hold. Um, is order, is that the, is that a good word? Um, I guess. Perry's mentioning add to cart is pretty common. Um, I guess with sorry, with the um, with the holds. As soon as you click on that, you could. Uh, there's not really a cart interface for that, so it might I think maybe confuse them a little bit. Um, but there is an add to kind of with the list there. Um, <clears throat> DLA is mentioning that uh, borrow um, so Buzzy it was yesterday at the meeting uh, the user council meeting, we just kind of mentioned that there was some kind of talk about the wording for title versus volume holds. Uh, I guess staff were, some staff might have thought that was a little confusing. Um, I think maybe within the patron interface, I think placehold is pretty, pretty common. Um, and request that could also, request could be changed maybe to be, say, something like, you know, request this copy. Um, so that they know that that's different from placehold here or placehold on this copy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to address what I heard. Um,
right. Um, I'm not hearing a lot from a lot of chatter, but um, well, okay, sorry, I gotta go back up the chat log here. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So it seems kind of there isn't a big uh, uh, problem with the current wording, but um, yeah, I just wanted to get people's opinions on that. Um, Want to make sure that it's not too confusing for the patrons or staff. Um, Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, Delia mentioned that perhaps patrons didn't know that when they're placing the hold, the actual borrowing was going to take place. Um, so maybe are you kind of saying that uh, when they click on this place hold link that they're maybe not aware that that actually sets in motion the whole transit and um, kind of hold shelf process. Um, and actually while we're, yeah, oh yeah, Joe Sixpack. <laughs> um, I think another also interesting thing to note with, um, that kind of ties into this, what's happening when you place a hold, is um, at the meeting yesterday I mentioned that when patrons are looking at help, um, this managing an online library account was one of the most clicked on links on the patron help page right here. Um, and one of the reasons I think that could be is that it's mentioning how to um, change things about your, uh, about your account and also I, don't know, I need to set a header link to this. Um, or flag, but uh, another common thing we hear from patrons through that form is how do I see what I've checked out? How do I see what I have placed on hold? Um, and these are what are known as opt-in preferences. Uh, these do not automatically happen for kind of privacy reasons. We don't want to just keep a list um, running out on an open website if um, we don't have to. Um, so kind of maybe educating patrons that when they log in, they can go check this um, to see what their holds are like, um, as well as keep a history of it. And letting them know that that's not retroactive. Uh, that's another big thing. Just kind of wanted to touch on that. Okay. All right, um, let's see. Okay, I just kind of was curious if there were any, maybe other questions that people did not Feel they did not get addressed today uh, at the at the CERT committee meeting. I just want to make sure that I didn't kind of bulldoze over anyone that had something to say. Hey, Brad. Yes. Um, are we still looking into the possibility of trying to get rid of volume level holds, like solving the few problems where they're useful? Um, trying to eliminate them. Yeah, we, we talked about that yesterday at the meeting a little bit, um, and anyone who was there can certainly chime in too. Um, I think that there was, at least in the meeting, I felt a kind of uh, a feeling that the volume holds would be okay to 
kind of do away with if you know there was that other option for staff to place them on magazine holds, which were kind of the main holdout for the need for volume holds. Um, but I don't want to. I know there were certain libraries that definitely wanted those volume holds because they wanted um, specific items or patrons to be able to sp uh, get specific volumes or uh, call number items. But I just want to make sure that you know patrons are aware uh, of what's happening. That that type of hold is different. Um, so, I mean, I, I I personally would like to do away with them. I don't know if anyone else in the meeting here has any differing opinions. I'd be willing to be very excited to hear your uh, opinions if you have some. I don't know. I've, I've talked about this many times. It's just it, it seems like the number of problems that they generate far exceeds the small benefit that they have. I I would agree from my side there. <clears throat> Does anyone have any opinions on that or? If I remember the conversation from last time this came up, I think Harney objected to not having that option available because they seem to have done a lot of uh, work to train their patrons to place holds on volume or copy levels to prevent um, items from coming outside their own system. Um, save career costs. I don't know what the justification was, but I believe they had strong feelings. Yeah, um, I see that Claire, I think, is here from uh, Harney County. Uh, are you able to say something about that, Claire? Or do you have any information, maybe? could be a mic issue. Oh, yeah, Heidi, Heidi just mentioned at least with some concern for the volume holds is the need to talk to catalogers about the work involved in changing the magazines to parts instead of kind of what's traditionally been done with call numbers kind of serving that function. And I can see definitely talking to the catalogers, but I guess I would even argue that switching magazines to at least temporarily to just be only staff can place item level magazine holds, I think would still be better than having the volume holds available to patrons. They're just, they're so problematic. Okay. Also, um, Brent, you, you had yes. written a note that talked about using the word place instead of request. Mm -hmm. I think Perry was suggesting the opposite. Oh. Or, well, I suggested request, but I think Perry was saying that the, the verb place might not, not make sense, might as much sense to non-English speakers. I suggested request. I don't know if it would make more sense. But. That's true. Yeah, I do understand request. Um, Definitely makes a little more sense right off the bat than place. It's a little more. As we've been talking, I've kind of been looking at what other systems do, like Washington County and Multnomah and Deschutes, and they're kind of, they all pretty much use this request versus place a hold thing, but they're kind of, nobody, there's not really a consistent one that they choose between those. Yeah. I think just... I think the reason you see Pines has placehold is just because it's the default. Um, right now, let's see. Um, WCCLS uses requested, I think. 
Yeah, they have requested there. Um, Multnomah County uses place a hold. Okay. Um, Shoots uses place a hold. And it looks like at least um, I think Washington County is using Polaris. Um, I don't yeah. believe they're using uh, a version of. I don't have credentials, but I don't um, think they. I think it's just Deschutes, a title level. Multnomah County are both using, I don't know what they use on the back end, I think Deschutes uses IIII, but they're also both using Biblio Commons, which I think adds its own layer on top, right? Yeah, yeah, they are using Biblio Commons. It's, yeah, so that's definitely going to change what the look is. Um. Eugene uses placehold request every null basis. <laughs> oh, there. That one's like sounds even more confusing. Coos <laughs> uh, County uses placehold. King County uses placehold too. It's surprising because they, I know they have a, a large non. English-speaking population. Well, I mean, some of it could be um, if it's the default in Evergreen, they're just sticking to the default. Um, CCRLS is also using placehold. I think they use, do they use Polaris? No, they use Circe Dynix. Mm -hmm. Some of this could be just the like places haven't thought that much about it and they're just using whatever the ILS defaults it to be. Yeah. It'd be hard to kind of figure out without doing a usability test uh, what's being problematic there because it'd just be people would click it or they wouldn't. So, um, yeah, but I think that definitely is. I would, and request definitely fits in real. Um, just as, and I think Ann just mentioned. Um, find it and request it as an option. Um, well, I think the find it is a little bit different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. WCCLS uses request it. Yeah. Um, I can also, if you guys want, I can talk to Patty, our, outreach, our bilingual outreach specialist, and see if she has any thoughts on which one, if either, makes more sense. Okay. Ann just mentioned that some of their Spanish-speaking students at the high school uh, like request it. Um, yeah, I guess the main thing, at least with with our situation, is while these uh, like Washington County or Multnomah County, they strictly only allow you know a version of title holds. They don't let them get patrons get this uh, granular. So we'd have to make sure that they understood the difference between these two links. So maybe it would have to be requested and request this one or something like that. I don't feel like the wording could be the same. I mean, if we're committed to keeping volume level holes, then you could do request it <laughs> and then order this copy. Hmm. Okay, that's there. I'll ask Patty to see what she thinks. Yeah, um, yeah Heidi mentions that the, the K-Pack uses get it. So <laughs> very to the point. And definitely with the K-Pack, uh, Heidi, that also only allows title holds. Um, I kind of made sure while kids are using this, I didn't want them messing with um, trying to do a volume hold. Um, so I guess, you know, we're talking about the wording, but is there any way, Brent, that mm -hmm. uh, when you are in the actual catalog record itself, or actually, or even when you're on the short 
like place hold, it doesn't really stand out very well. Like a lot of the catalogs I look at, it's like a button, like mm -hmm. an obvious button that you click. But for us, it's really not. Is there a way to make it stand out more? I mean, yeah, that'd be just like a, I think a CSS thing. <clears throat> so, like, like for example, uh, if I do a s in the results field, uh, let's see. I mean, this place hold right here. Yeah, it's just, you know, a lot of catalogs you look at, and that would be like a green box that says placeholder inside of it. You know, it would be pretty obvious. Yeah, I definitely then... Kind of, well, it would look kind of like the another search and advanced search buttons. Yeah, I think that would definitely be um, uh, an option. I think right now, at least I assume the reason that it's still set to these uh, text links is because when they're going... Uh, when you're trying to make it responsive, it's a little easier. You can kind of see um, they have it set like that, but uh, that would not be hard. I mean, I changed these links to buttons up here. It's just like a little teeny bit of CSS. Um, yeah, see if Claire says, okay. Oh, so Claire kind of meant, did a, people want to look in the chat log about kind of Harney County and the history of the volume holds, um, the hated green check mark. Um, people don't like that check mark. <laughs> I, I think that a lot of those issues largely got worked out when Beth and Brent went through and put in the career prior, the prior career priority. Scheme. Okay, I haven't. Um, let's see. I hate a green check mark. Okay, I think. Yeah, it definitely can be kind of you know people. Um, just you know remembering how things might have been in the past um, and kind of using that as a default uh, kind of behavior for some things. Um, I will say just from my experience and talking with the developers at the conference that if you want the most kind of smart uh, way for Evergreen to figure out what a hold's going to be, um, this place hold with the hated green check mark, um, or you know this one right here, uh, that that takes in the most variables and ways you know proximity. Um, who the patron is, where the patron's from, their fines, things like that. Um, well, not yeah, just I'll, proximity, but also like, it doesn't Beth have it programmed so that it, it's not just proximity, it's also just how many, like how many times a week does the courier stop at that location? Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm almost positive she does. So I think she like okay. she like privileges, for instance, like us in the Dallas and Baker County because we have five day a week courier service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there could be there so are some other like stuff. Stuff is more likely to come from us depending on place because we have five day a week service instead of two day a week service, for instance. Yeah. Um. And also, yeah, with the title hold, if the item does go missing, it does kick it over to another item, which kind of helps avoid that dead hold situation. Um, unless there are, you know, for example, this record right here is an example of even if you put <clears throat> a title hold on it, if this copy went missing, that hold would still just churn because there's only one copy. But it's still a better option than um, just having that singular copy as a volume hold. Um, yeah, so for, for the styling, that is definitely an option. I've played around with that myself. I don't want to do uh, any stylistic changes that people would not want. Um, I felt just, you know, we can even change. This is not a problem, and I've actually wanted to, uh, at some point, uh, figure out a way to kind of clean up the mobile display 
that we have. Um, yeah, if libraries, I can definitely try this out on the test server and kind of give screenshots for examples. Um, but yeah, making that a button would not be a problem or even dropping this add list to um, beneath it as well so it doesn't look on the same page or line. Um, yeah. Okay, Rose, uh, let's see. Rose just mentioned that um, uh, when there's one copy and it's marked missing, is there an option for the requesting library being notified? Uh, um, let's see, there was a report requested on the listserv for Evergreen, um, like a last copy report. It would be difficult, I think, just right now off the top of my head, thinking about, uh, for example, you know, um, if Ontario lost their copy, um, that they would be emailed that, hey, it was your copy that was the last one. Um, you know, this title is now dead. There are dead title reports that we can do. Um, well, I, I think, no. Sorry, Brian, go ahead. Oh, yeah. I, I was just trying to make sure I understood the, the question. So I don't know what other libraries do, but part of our procedures for pulling the holds is if um, if we have a hold on an item and we can't find it, and we're the only library that has it, and we're not, we don't think we're likely to find it anytime soon, we um, cancel the hold. And for our patrons, we notify them the hold's canceled, and for other libraries' patrons, we cancel the hold and we write a note in in you know at the cancel hold screen saying. It was the last available copy and that we couldn't find it. Um, we also try to, if possible, move the hold onto another bib of the same item if that is available. Oftentimes it isn't, but you know, if it's like we had a paperback copy of it and we were the only ones that had a paperback copy, but there are hardback copies, then we'd move move the patron's hold over to another one. Yeah, that's a good idea for a situation like that. Um, yeah, I, I agree. That's kind of good practice to do. I know there there is there was a trigger that we had to disable for when a staff member cancels a patron's hold. It would send that patron uh, an email letting them know that the hold was canceled. But you know there were issues where you know patrons were getting way too many emails, or you know if you canceled it and placed another hold for them, and then had to cancel that, they would get a couple. Well, the biggest issue we had with that was. The vast majority of times when we were canceling a hold is because the patron asked us to cancel the hold. Mm -hmm. So they didn't really want an email because they already emailed us asking us to cancel the hold. Okay. Oh, and another thing I just kind of to riff off what Rose was saying, if there's one copy and it's marked missing, is there an option for the requesting library to be notified? Um, if we did away with these volume holds, um, for example, if this was marked missing, uh, there would be no way for this to even show up. So patrons themselves would not be able to place a hold on an item that only had missing copies. Uh, the issue would only arise if it was marked missing after they placed a hold. Um, so that's just another kind of piece of info. And that was kind of, I think, also one of the reports. Sorry, I'm trying not to dance around here. Um, there was items, there was auditing, let's see. Okay, so there's the unfilled holds, but we could definitely do, um, I could figure out, you know, uh, dead titles report or something along those lines. Um, items with only a missing copy attached to them, or records with only <clears throat> a missing copy attached to them. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
I don't want to keep everyone. They've already, you've already been so gracious as to let me go over uh, time uh, from 11 here. Uh, so I guess unless anyone else has um, any other questions, I think I'm going to move forward and um, work on these notes that we have. Oh, let's make sure that I get everyone on the attending list. Uh, make sure I don't miss anyone. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, definitely the main thing that I would like to plug is please let me know what you think here. I want to make sure that everyone's represented. Uh, I've got you, Darlene, on the list. Thanks. Um, I'll send out that renewal survey. We definitely need to get that done. Um, I'll work with Heidi on getting, drafting out a quick kind of policy set up, um, mentioning what Perry did, that if that is an issue, there is an option maybe with uh, putting in those security cards. Work on the holds training some more. And I'm not sure if we really kind of came to a firm understanding of it, but uh, with the holds wording, maybe send out kind of a question to the listserv if, um, you know, request could be more easily understood than placehold. Uh, I know that, let's see, Buzzy was going to ask, uh, uh, I actually, um, I just texted her asking her, and she said, oh, that's a really good question. Let me think about that. <laughs> We've stumped her, too. Okay. So, yeah, um, so, and it doesn't have to be buzzy. If, uh, yeah, Delia said she'll also ask um, some of her folks as well. Um, yeah, just please uh, feel free. You can even send it out on the listserv. Don't have to send it to me. Um, it'd be a good discussion to have. Um, Okay, and all right, um, I think that's all that I really have. Uh, if there's anything that someone feels that I might have missed, um, please let me know before I hang up on everybody. Okay, silence is golden. All right, well, thanks um, everyone for coming to the meeting. It was uh, real great hearing from everybody here, and I think we uh, got some good stuff done. Um, so I guess I'll see every single one of you on June 15th at uh, 10 a.m. I will also be putting that up on the, as soon as you go to sagelib.org, you will log in as staff, and it will be right here. So whenever you see that new CERC meeting, you can just click on that, and it will give you all the info you need. And I'll be posting the video and the transcript of this uh, meeting as well. All right, well, thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great weekend later on and Wednesday. Thank you.